we didn't do an ICO. We don't have our own crypto. We're just making wallets that people can store their crypto offline. Well, yeah, so I can show them for anyone who, who listens in. I guess we can, we can start now. So, Kurt. Oh, do you have it? Yeah, oh, cool. we start with the product plug. Yeah, product plug. So I got I have my, oh <laughs> my Ethereum and my Bitcoin. Uh, here. Excellent. They make uh, they make excellent Christmas gifts. I gave uh, stocking was, stuffers. We well, yeah, yeah. So you know, like I, I gave um, or a Valentine's gift. No, well, well, with the King That's Day right. gift. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> President's Day gift. Uh, Anti President's Day gift. Uh, just because. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I, I gave one to my father-in-law, and it was, you know, he, he's, he's not buying crypto on his own, but now you sort of force it to him. And then, uh, and then I gave one to uh, a friend of mine who works at a regulatory agency who said he would never own crypto. And so it's like, Perfect. of course, now you do. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, but he, wait, he wait, wait a minute. What's that on your shirt? Is that Ron Paul? Yeah, I had to wear it. Uh, <laughs> Wow, my man. For the talk right today, because I, I remember, so, you know, you worked on the campaign or with the campaign in some sense? I have. I worked on his uh, uh, 2008 and 2012 campaigns. I worked for Rand Paul's 2010 Senate campaign and uh, helped them with their money bombs and their marketing, uh, online marketing. Yeah, no, I remember times. that. You know, that was... Yeah. I thought I it was the colonel from Kentucky Fried Chicken. But. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against Ron Paul. I think he's a nice guy, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not I think as close to, to to him as, as I know that Nick is, and, I, and now I know that that you are uh, very much a fan. Well, I think that, uh, yeah. that that's like a good segue into you know, kind of like how did so. How, I guess, did you get into this in the first place? You know, I, I think the old story that is becoming kind of increasingly unique was that it was, you know, this libertarian uh, thing that people just got into because of that. Was that sort of your story as well? Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it really is. It's a, it, it's a story of, of waking up to what economics really is and how it connects directly to a human being's ability to be free. And, uh, and I think that from, from uh, the standpoint of you know, uh, Ron Paul's being a politician, uh, really when I think of Ron Paul, I think of him as uh, sort of a, um, a messenger of freedom and economics. And uh, there's no way to have a free society unless you have a free economic system, a free market system that, that truly is not manipulated. And uh, any, any system that, uh, well, basically the system that we're in right now is a, is a sort of a state corporatist system. And that's a collusion between state and company and businesses. And our economy is controlled by a private entity and uh, and then anybody that understands that uh, and and the ramifications and the impact that has on people in a variety of ways, uh, there there can you know in my case I I became passionate based on uh, realizing that um, our country the United States uh, specifically has had a uh, kind of a underground battle between those who believe in freedom and those who want to control uh, people. And that battle has been within the, the financial system. We've had three central banks in our history. And uh, the last uh, introduction to central banking to control the money supply uh, was done through an amendment. And that's a very interesting story. I hope somebody makes it into a movie someday because, I mean, just take The Creature from Jekyll Island and turn that into a film, and that would be a really cool movie. I, I would love to be a producer on that film. Pick the <laughs> actors. And, but what do you think, Nick? Can we, can we do yeah, that? Yeah, I mean, Mike's film? the movie producer. Well, <laughs> here, I think. Oh, Mike he is. is. <laughs> in, um, in a past life. 
Um, nice. So wait, I'm I'm actually intrigued. Uh, tell me more about this story. I mean, can is there a cliff notes? Sure. So uh, so what happened in terms of the third central bank? The I, I think the story uh, would have to be centered around the most recent one, the Federal Reserve Banking System, and how that came about. And what happened was um, in, 20, in, in uh, 1912, um, there were things leading up to this point to create fear and to get people motivated to take an interest in a centralized banking system. Um, but under false names, bankers went to an island off the coast of Georgia. I like, actually live in Georgia. The island is called Jekyll Island. Mm -hmm. And uh, they wrote the uh, 16th Amendment. Bankers wrote it and then took it back to Washington. And it was voted on by uh, politicians. I believe it was on Christmas Eve when all of the other politicians who were against this amendment went home. And so it was done without uh, two thirds of the, of the country's states ratify ratifying the 16th amendment. It was pushed through and uh, Woodrow Wilson signed it into law as of the executive uh, branch. But there were a lot of things in play that led up to that in terms 16th of- 16th amendment being the income tax, correct? Uh, the Federal Reserve Act. The, the income Reserve tax Reserve. actually didn't happen until uh, several years later as part of the um, war effort and patriotism and, you know, pay 1% of your income voluntarily. Um, and what actually led me down the entire path was a, a movie that's a documentary called Freedom, From Freedom to Fascism, which was um, produced and directed by Aaron Russo, who is a Hollywood producer. It, it, you guys remember the film um, uh, Trading Places with Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd? Of course. You guys remember? Okay. So Eddie, um, Aaron Russo made that film. Oh, and cool. Aaron Russo made The Rose with Bette Midler and uh, Teachers with Nick Nolte. Aaron Russo was cool, man. He brought Led Zeppelin to the United States. I mean, it, you know, there's there's no cooler dude in Hollywood than Aaron Russo. So he makes this documentary back in 2006, and the premise of the documentary is what is the, where is the law that says that American citizens have to pay taxes on their individual income? Because there is no law. He interviews uh, former IRS agents. He follows a court case where um, uh, the jurors are, are actually in the film talking about this. He interviews the former head of the IRS who wrote a lot of the tax code. The former head of the IRS threatens him on camera in Yiddish. I mean, it's a really interesting documentary. And so, you know, it's a kind of a scary subject back then. Um, and what, what he does is he documents a little bit of the history of uh, the bankers and the coup d'etat on the American economy by bankers. And, uh, uh, you know, the Federal Reserve note is, is uh, produced by a private company. Our, our U.S. dollar, which is a global currency, is created by private individuals who own a company. We don't even know the owners of the company today. Nobody knows who actually owns the Federal Reserve. <laughs> And so that documentary uh, was taken to Cannes Film Festival. It was critically acclaimed at Cannes. And then Aaron Russo, this big Hollywood producer with all those creds that I just told you about, brings it back to the US. Not one news agency would interview him about the film. Not one theater uh, would pick up the film to play it in the theaters. Okay, he got totally shut down by the US uh, on all levels because of fear, I would say. And so what he did was he released it on Google Video for free. And it got millions of hits. And somebody sent it to me on this uh, strange, obscure website called MySpace. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, but uh, sure. 
<laughs> yeah, uh, so in 2007, somebody sent me that, and Ron Paul was in the video. This congressman, this strange congressman who always says no to all these bills, and uh, and I watched this film, and uh, and my gut was sick. And suddenly, this very, very uh, you know non-political guy uh, starts to wake up to something new and different. And after watching that film, I watched it again that night. My girlfriend came home. I said, you got to watch this film. I canceled all my appointments. I watched this movie, and it completely changed my life. And, uh, and the rest is history. I started exploring. I wanted to check, you know, fact check all this information, and, and I did. And I, and I started to realize that there was something going on that, uh, that really gave me purpose, and that was... Uh, that uh, honest money didn't exist. And then uh, Bitcoin was introduced in 2009. And I remember when Bitcoin was sold, I think it was October, I forget, the first time Bitcoin actually was, was bought and sold with currency. It was October 9th, I think, of 2009. And, uh, and then we had this new money that was not controlled by any central institution and can't be coerced and used to manipulate and uh, maybe maybe it was possible to have an honest money for people right i mean well were you were you sort of i guess in the gold camp before bitcoin came along uh, yes. and kind of do you still yeah. see yourself uh, you know i know there's still a big debate here even amongst libertarians like you'll see you know i know peter schiff for instance he says gold is the one true Sure. So, yeah, I love gold. Uh, our company manufactures gold coins. Our, our company has been manufacturing coins before Bitcoin was in diapers, before Bitcoin even existed. We were making uh, uh, community currency. We actually, our history is, uh, is all about pushing back on uh, fiat systems. And so we were making community currency out of silver, uh, silver barter, barter currency. Um, a lot of people may not realize that um, the, what do you mean by the currency? United States, well, uh, barter systems are actually legal in the U.S. There's the Ithaca Hours in Ithaca, New York. That's barter like trading Spanish. for services, trading goods for services? Or That's service correct. For and, services. Right. And you can use notes to do that in communities, local, local currency. And um, and so we were making it. We made so you can almost like come up with your own IOU system, kind of thing. When you say that's dope? right, okay. correct, correct. And cool. we we did this for sovereign nations uh, in the United States. Our our most popular one was the Lakota Nation, the American Indian Nation. And if you look up Lakota uh, silver coins, you'll see our coin. Uh, that's us. And it was made by the American Open Currency Standard. Um, and that's the standard that we've used the entire time. Our CEO actually testified before U.S. Congress. His name's Rob Gray, and Rob uh, was asked by Ron Paul to testify before the Congressional Monetary Policy Hearing on competing currencies to discuss the, the uh, value of having competing currencies and what that would mean. And during that session, uh, Rob Gray said that he basically called the Federal Reserve Bank a den of thieves in on the congressional floor, which is mm. kind of neat. And yeah, uh, so I mean, like, so the idea of community currencies versus like competing currencies, you know, are the, the like, are, do you see? I mean, I think your ideal would be like everyone sort of issues their own currency and the best ones kind of float to the top. Is that kind of the, uh, <laughs> yeah, let the market decide because sure. why, why can't people, why can't individuals decide what they want to use in terms of, of a barter system? And I think that's one of the exciting things about uh, cryptocurrency is that we have these uh, different types of currencies with characteristics that are different. Uh, the, the supply, amounts are different, whether or not they inflate or not. Um, 
the ability to uh, utilize them for technology is, uh, is kind of a neat thing. But one of the things I think Peter Schiff uh, doesn't understand is that Bitcoin as a unit of measure is not the only part of the value of Bitcoin. It's actually the system itself. It solves three issues because Bitcoin is a, uh, is a platform that is a ledger, which you know a lot of people understand that that every transaction is recorded on a the ledger system that's decentralized around the world on computers all over the world. Uh, but that's just one part of it. It's also a transaction service. It's a simple transaction service uh, as opposed to having to use a third party like a uh, PayPal or Venmo or, or cash, which are all I think valuable. Uh, services. I don't think they're going to go away anytime soon, but uh, but Bitcoin offers uh, that, and then it has the unit of measure, which is called a Bitcoin. So you have the blockchain system itself, uh, the service of transaction, and then the uh, the unit of measure, and those three things are combined into one. That's never existed before. It's revolutionary, just in in the impact of it being a, a usable service. Uh, with the built-in currency, and um, and it and it also is a trustless system. In other words, we don't have to worry about a bank screwing it up. The problem with, I think, this particular uh, system is that it requires people to change the way that they live, in the, in their perspective, in their their way of life, really, and and they have to. Uh, what we're asking people to do by adopting something like Bitcoin is we're asking them to become personally responsible. And that's a tough sell because we're so used to depending on third parties. So you would have to, in a sense, be a self-bank. Well, and sometimes. I mean, you mm -hmm. sort of see, I'd say the mo most of the people who own Bitcoin at the moment really just leave it on Coinbase. Uh, <laughs> You know, or like you see the whole big push with, yeah. I don't know if you've heard probably backed, for instance, is they're going to be the custodian for Wall Street, it seems. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Do, yeah. It, and and I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that because there's still third parties and uh, we see the, the big hacks in Japan and uh, we see uh, what, what happens if a government that controls that particular business decides that they want to take that business down. So, uh, you know, that's, these are concerns that uh, decentralization, you know, that's the other, that's the characteristic of, of crypto. Decentralization really does need to encourage uh, self-banking. Um, we need to hold our own private keys. If you have an account on a third party uh, platform, uh, either a trading platform or a uh, some sort of a hybrid, like some of the companies you've mentioned, you do not own the private keys. If if you have a Coinbase account, you don't hold the private keys, so you really don't own your currency. Right. Uh, that that company does. And, and you can say the uh, same. You know, I mm -hmm. guess someone might say, well, what's the difference between? I mean, in a cash system and a fiat system, can't you? You know, keep your cash underneath your mattress you know what i mean and be your own bank mm -hmm. in that way true you know? but you still you don't really have your private keys quote unquote when you just have your cash either because you don't control i mean the monetary system is you know you don't control the value of the dollar and it's not stable and the you know the government controls the value of that mm -hmm. yeah and well and and that's the thing that this whole world, you know, I, I was approached by a uh, former VP of Goldman Sachs when I was at a conference in Miami uh, last month. And we were talking about the, the idea of cryptocurrency and the fluctuation of value. And, uh, and that's driven by uh, the market to a degree, but there are other forces involved. And there's speculation that, you know, governments are, are trying to uh, manipulate the value for whatever reason, but um, those are fun things to talk about. 
But the reality of all currencies and all things is that everything is speculative. Relationships with human beings, all the way through uh, the value of stuff. Well, this is it's all spec because we don't know the future. Well, this if, is like the subjective value argument, it's kind of moving mm -hmm. into like Austrian economics, where there you go. Yeah, you know, it's everything sort of is what people will are willing to pay for it. Right, and there's always risk. We we have risk with our hearts, our minds, and our in our pocketbooks. But wouldn't it be a neat thing to know that there isn't a group of individuals that's uh, controlling it and for their own benefit and, uh, you know, funding wars, guns and butter, uh, you know, uh, manipulating governments. And that's what's exciting to me about this technology is, is maybe it would, uh, you know, create, here's, here's the big question. Why are we all on this? on this uh, call right now. What is, what is it that has created this interview? Yeah, it's just kind of Bitcoin uh, would be the first <laughs> catalyst, yeah. but just kind of the idea and the excitement about freedom and being able to own it on your own. You know, I don't think you have to talk us into it. Yeah, I mean, and we've all been asking a new set of questions, you know, you know, since for me, you know, the first time I started to hear about this stuff was actually when Ron Paul sort of came into the the mass lens, you know, and I never really got too crazy into it, but it was the first time I started to think about monetary policy ever in my life. Um, and I still don't think about it that much, but it was the first time I started to ask those questions. And, um, and then, of course, with, with Bitcoin coming about was like a spiritual continuation of that sort of thing um so you know you guys know. are you guys are are uh are you in different locations yes okay so uh nick is in one location michael's in another kurt's in another location and we're talking to each other on devices over the internet using electricity and uh, next week, I'm going to be getting on a uh, a plane that looks like a bird. I'm going to fly across, you know, in the air, and I'm going to I'm going to go eat at a restaurant, eat food that is made uh, and and produced in in another country, and it's brought over, you know. Uh, it, and and my point is is that you know, like this morning. I woke up and I woke up very early. I went into a kitchen, you know, made with technology and I cooked some coffee on my stove. I got some half and half out of a refrigerator and I turned on a thing called a television and I, I watched something on uh, my fire stick and on demand and you know, so why isn't money catching up to all that? It's even deeper than that. Why, why is it that we have the ability to create all of these amazing things, you know, uh, giant yachts and airplanes and tall buildings and, uh, and, and all of the electronic technology, but we're not capable of allowing each other to be free? Sure. You know, I why think... haven't we figured that out? And, and maybe big. Bitcoin could be an answer to the technology of blockchain, could be an answer to replacing government systems and allowing people to have mutual uh, agreements with one another without coercion, without force. And, you know, what is it, why is it that a, a bunch of monkeys who have been able to create all of these incredible advancements were flying into space and, I mean, just the, the, the limitless imagination that we have, yet we can't stop interfering with each other's private property yeah well i mean you can kind of i guess we can like shift a little bit you know like where how do you see it kind of playing up moving forward like jumping back to you know now now coinbase holds a lot of the, the private keys and, <laughs> and other and other similar systems and, and a lot of people say institutional investors are going to get in do you see as that being a temporary thing and then we sort of 
privatize it over time as people get more comfortable holding their own private keys? Or is it going, or is, or are you going to have different systems? Well, that's what our business is. Our business is, pers- uh, is really fostering personal responsibility. Uh, yes, our, our product can be a, a great product for giving people uh, the gift of crypto and wallet adoption, which is really our focus with uh, the partner that we have. We, we partner with a, an international kiosk company. You know, when you go to the uh, box store and you buy a gift card off the rack, uh, Amazon or Best Buy or whatever the, you know, the yeah, yeah, yeah. For, for a gift, you buy a $25 card and you load it at the register. Well, that's what these coins are being packaged for. So we've partnered with a company that is um, uh, in 275,000 stores worldwide. They're in the biggest stores around the world, biggest chains. And they manage the gift card kiosks. And they're really excited. They, they uh, approached us back in the summer of 2018. And we are uh, launching in April. And we're going to, uh, 2019, and we're going to introduce uh, these cold storage coins where people can go onto the rack, grab an Amazon card, a cold storage coin, and go to the register and load it, activate it, and walk out of the store. And so so it'll do, like have Bitcoin on it? Like, so yes, yeah, so it'll have Bitcoin on the coin. Mm-hmm. And, that's and it'll like, be loaded at the register. Yeah. That, that's awesome. I think, you yeah. know, the, I'm curious to see. Yeah, like, yeah, just your grocery store is holding Bitcoins. That's going to be. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it's, you know, it's a, it, we're starting off in uh, Asian countries because they're the most favorable. And then uh, we'll go from there. But, the um, you know that's the mass wallet adoption play, but the the more important thing is regardless of whether you use cold storage coins or some other form of of cold storage, getting your crypto offline, getting your Bitcoin offline, or whatever other cryptos you might uh, favor, uh, holding them offline uh, protects you ultimately from hacking, and uh, and it also but it also requires it is self banking. Self-banking is going to be a, a, a prominent part of this industry because um, why should it, you know these other companies that are out there that provide swift and easy services the the hot wallets that are out there or warm wallets even the treasures and ledgers uh, they provide a valuable service in terms of having quick accessibility to uh, smaller amounts for spending for for paying bills and and you know going grocery shopping and buying gifts and just buying our, our essentials or whatever we need to do for travel, uh, you know, operating your business, that sort of thing. But when it comes to your larger amount of holdings, that needs to be in cold storage without a doubt. And it needs to be held by, you know, myself or you and that, but that's a change in, in behavior and that's a tough sell and it just takes time. That, that I, when I think about that, it's like, I feel like we might be overestimating like the masses you know, or, you know, they're just at a point where they're not ready yet. You know, the conversations is, is always is crypto or when is crypto going to be ready for mass adoption? And I think like, when are we going to be ready for mass adoption? <laughs> you know, like when are we going to, you know, as a, as a population, it feels like personal responsibility is going downwards more than it's going upwards. <laughs> like, I don't know. I, I don't mean to be pessimistic about it. It's a tough sell. Yeah. Not many told, people are ready to be their own bank or want to, you know, right. even if they should, even if it's in our own best interest, we don't really act in our own best interest very often. Well, that's always, I think the biggest argument against like libertarianism in general is like, well, do people want freedom? <laughs> it's the big right. question. Mm-hmm. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, this, I think what people want is they want to be left alone. But the 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 the, the big they the big want thing freedom is, is that, you, But are they prepared to do the 
take the responsibility. It's not easy to be responsible. There's a lot of mistakes and challenges about being responsible, but the rewards, if you are, are, are amazing. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. And, and, uh, and that's the neat thing about this is that will people be interested in it? And is it, you know, what is it that here, here's the other question is, uh, we're forced to use the federal reserve note, right? The U S dollar. We're forced to use that, mm -hmm. okay? But we're not forced to use Bitcoin. Bitcoin is being adopted voluntarily. So there's an indicator. And, uh, and that's so an interesting- Those people that are ready or more ready for those type of things. It, well, it, it attracts people that are looking at it as a speculative investment. They buy and sell trading, that sort of thing. So there's that element. But in terms of everyday use, it's we're not in, we're not there. I get my hair cut with Bitcoin, and how that happened is I sat down and I started talking to the woman that is my barber, and we discussed it. And she said, "You know, I'm curious about it. Can you explain it to me?" And I explained it to her in under one minute, which I've got my under one minute pitch to a newbie, and uh, and I use that well, on. We got to hear it. And, Ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to go. And, uh, uh, and, and she said, I would be, I would love to own some. How do I own some? And I said, well, let me go out to my truck and I'll get a, a awesome. storage coin. I'm going to load, I'm going to load uh, the amount for the haircut. And ever since then, I've been sending her, uh, I, I take my son up there, he gets his haircut, I get my haircut and I pay her in Bitcoin and that's it. And so, you know, it's a, it's an opportunity for me to be able to spend Bitcoin and it's an opportunity for her to, to accept it. But uh, it, you know, the, the thing that I think is going on with the, the industry itself is that uh, it's the supply leading demand. It's one of the most unique uh, situations in terms of that because we don't have the demand yet we have all this supply and we're setting it all up with the expect, expectation of demand. And there is a lot of movement in that direction, but it's a very weird and obscure thing because there is a philosophy behind it. And uh, what is it that would motivate people to adopt it? I, I don't know. I don't know what the, the full answer is to that. For me, it's freedom, but for other people, it could be something else. And, um, you know, it, may, it may not work. It Do you think it'll work. be diluted, I, you know, if diluted, not diluted? <laughs> Maybe we're all diluted, but... Uh, <laughs> you think I'm, I'm diluted all the time. <laughs> I just don't know hey, it, so it's okay. People, well, we choose to be diluted. <laughs> like, this is what I choose to believe in. Um, diluted in the sense of, uh, you know, as, as, as institutions get involved or as mass adoption happens, you know, it'll move from, you know, being a more pure, not that it's pure at all right now, but uh, from being more about those, those philosophical, you know, spiritual even reasons, political reasons um, to just dilute it in, in, in any number of ways from just people that want to make money or it's just easy, you know, I can see a lot mm -hmm. of people just wanting to use it because it simplifies their life in some way. Yeah, I think that that's, it, it has to be made easy to use. And there are some platforms out there that are uh, uh, starting to create that. I think one of them is called Money Pop. And, uh, you know, make the technology does need to think in terms of re, uh, relating to your average person. And so there are, right now, here's, here's the two impediments to adoption that I have identified kind of in a simple format. One is uh, education, which requires time, and the other one is fear. And with the education side of it, um, most people don't want to or have the interest or motivation or, or reason to take a class in blockchain technology so that they know how to download a wallet, they go on an exchange, they go buy the stuff, and then they, 
you know, and then what do you do with it other than sell it to somebody else who's speculating on it? And, you know, it, it, there isn't, uh, you can't go to the coffee shop and buy coffee with it. And so there's that part of it. And no, I, then I get there's that. the I other guess, side I of it. Really, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in, but what I'm really curious mm -hmm. about someone who has a very pure sort of perspective on the need and the reasons why and what it could achieve for us as society or community is, uh, you know, can you, is there any part of you that's worried about the day, you know, some, some day in the future, five years from now, 10 years, whatever it is, where we finally there and Bitcoin or crypto no longer looks like what you thought it would look like. It's morphed into something else because somehow mass adoption and that whole process changed it in a way that's not for the better. Do you, any part of you worried about that gloomy potential? I haven't ever thought of that. Um, I would well, say I, that that's the neat thing about the free market is that if something starts to go sour, uh, then there's, you know, the market can decide which direction it needs to go in. Well, I mean, you had, uh, you know, earlier, like in the nineties, like with PayPal, for instance, like I know Peter Thiel has said, like he, he ultimately wanted to create something similar to like Bitcoin originally, like, or it would be this internet cash, but then you know, basically due to regulations and just kind of the technology settled with PayPal, you know, like with, with Bitcoin, you know, one of the big issues, which it actually seems like you're trying to solve is kind of the fiat on ramping and kind of, there's these giant gatekeepers in the mm -hmm. system and, and it could very well turn into sort of this PayPal like system uh, with cryptocurrencies where, you know, you just have like Coinbase running one lightning node and then, <laughs> that's just where we all go and you know that's it, on amazon and we use bitcoin to buy things but is it really and that's that's sometimes my fear but i don't know if you've thought about that and you know i guess probably since now you're building a way for us to go buy it at the grocery store with cash <laughs> well hey, here's if, here's if the free market well, the free market led to that would you be okay with it well i would say that uh uh there's a universal intelligence that gets disrupted by greed and power. Mm -hmm. And what I'm not okay with is the uh, disruption in people's lives that would not normally have that disruption. And so, you know, what is the, what is the best opportunity for somebody who's on a fixed income than to have deflation in uh, and the price of goods and services as opposed to inflation, which is what we have now. So people that are on a fixed income cannot afford to meet the rate of inflation that occurs. And so they become poorer and poorer. People that are impoverished or on you know, so a disability or whatever the circumstances might be. And, uh, or they have a, a certain amount of retirement income that is set based on their projected lifespan. Uh, and so there's that part of it. And so the, the, the question has to be much bigger than, um, you know, some nefarious variable that happens out of this, you know, like an a, a asteroid hitting mm -hmm. Bitcoin somehow. Bitcoin is a limited supply. There are, very, there, are kind of, there are characteristics about Bitcoin that, uh, that are kind of neat. But the, the other part of it is that if something starts to go awry, and I'm not sure what that could be other than, uh, say, the amount of Bitcoin that would be available, 100, 100 million Satoshis per Bitcoin. Let's say that Bitcoin starts to become scarce because of the um the the loss aspect of it you know computers crashing and whatnot and the bitcoin dies forever uh, then or you know the other the other possibility uh, i don't know how much you guys know about this i don't have a lot of information on this maybe you guys do and you could talk about this 
is quantum computing and hacking the uh, private key uh, addresses, you know, coming, uh, pulling these, private, you know, creating enough private keys that uh, people could actually uh, sure. steal Bitcoin uh, through the supercomputing. You know, is that something that could happen? Maybe. maybe. Is there an answer to that? Is it, uh, instead of it being eight digits, making it uh, 64 digit private keys or something like that? I don't know. But that, you know, there are, there are possible uh, problems that could happen. I, I don't know what they are. And, uh, but this is all, we're all in a pioneering exploratory stage. Um, you know, I like to talk about the philosophy rather than the practicality sometimes, but I think it's really important, you know, to not go in blind. And all of this is speculative at this point. So I don't know if that answers your question at all or gives you a, yeah. a more no, honest it does. I think, response. No, yeah. why? no, it does. I, it sounds like, and I actually agree with this, is to be more possibility focused about this technology uh, is can be a, in a way more, more productive than practicality or um, pessimism or realism or, or, but you know, I, I'm, I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit here and I sometimes have a realist bent, but uh, I do really appreciate love it. the possibility of all, of, of all of this. Otherwise I wouldn't be involved. Like um, I'm super bullish mm -hmm. on all of it for sure. Yeah. Um, and then there's one thing I definitely wanted to ask you about. So I, um, you know, kind of just the community aspect of it. So I know like you had said, like Bitcoin is immutable, um, but sort of is it immutable in the sense that, you know, it sort of seems kind of controlled by the community and what the community sort of wants moving forward. Like, you know, there have mm -hmm. been kind of contentious hard forks in the past where it's sort of this general democracy type feel to it where you know where the majority of the users get to move in one direction and um is that the case and then the other case is um how important are kind of the values that we hold as a crypto community to mm -hmm. kind of keeping that immutability alive yeah um i do think that that um in terms of you're talking about price fluctuation or ownership or adoption the community or what in terms of uh how i guess what you're asking me is in terms of it being immutable yes. is, it, is it truly immutable and uh i would say that at this point the the answer to that has to be uh, that Bitcoin can be manipulated at this time with larger ownership. But it, it, it's affected by miners, the large mining companies out there. Uh, they can afford to sell Bitcoin at a lower price, which affects people being able to enter the market with mining operations. But th the thing is, is that there is a self-interest variable always in play. And so out of self-interest, uh, destroying Bitcoin um, would not help somebody who owns large amounts of it. And so, right. uh, you know, uh, manipulating it or trying to uh, somehow affect the value of it really is, uh, I, I think self-interest helps to a degree. But the other part of it is that for Bitcoin, Bitcoin is really still experimental until it becomes widely used. And once uh, there is a, there has to be, and I don't know what that number is, uh, a, a mathematical value as to how many people own it and the ability for it to uh, fluctuate the way that it does at this time. So. Mass wallet adoption, and a lot of people talk about this, mass wallet adoption will level out the value of it, will, yeah. will uh, create a, a stable value. The big concern and something that Michael kind of sparked in me is that something that I've, I've considered a lot in terms of the Bitcoin um, and, and devastation, global 
problems. And, and I, don't, I don't know how to describe what those problems are, but uh, an instability in the economic markets and governments, uh, militaries, and uh, banking systems is the possibility of a Weimar Germany type event, whereas Bitcoin becomes the preferred method of ownership and currency and that there's a tipping point, a run on the banks and a forced, you know, kind of a, a, a global fear that what type uh, of everybody event, needs. What type of every, event did you, that, I think uh, you made reference that went over my head. So Weimar Germany, uh, where there was a hyperinflation in Germany, where there was a run on the banks and everyone was going to the banks and getting money out of the banks. Um, and, it, it, because the money was losing value. And so I use that term kind of loosely, but the imagine this, at a certain percentage of ownership in Bitcoin, suddenly the world starts to get worried about the fact that their fiat currencies are declining quickly. And because the US dollar, the Euro, the yen, uh, whatever, currencies are, that people use within their particular region uh, starts to drop quickly in value because Bitcoin suddenly starts to become the world currency. And at that point, I don't know if it's 15% ownership globally or 50% or, or, you know, what is that number mm -hmm. where we have a global financial collapse because everyone's running to Bitcoin and getting out of their dying currency and that is a that is a real concern that i have and so is there you know is it good that bitcoin adoption is slow right now well, yeah i mean i don't think it would necessarily be ready for it quite yet with, especially with the transaction volume we want it to get to go fast maybe but i actually right. think it's be really careful late that it's not <laughs> right exactly so that as far as a real world concern that is a real world, world concern for me. And, uh, you know, and I, and I hope that spontaneous order, uh, you know, keeps that from turning into a, a real disaster around the world. Well, you sort uh, of, you know, any sort of cryptocurrency adoption sort of implies a technological society in general. You know, I think that's kind of the reason we haven't necessarily seen any crypto adoption. You see whether it's Venezuela or, the Zimbabwe hyperinflations that we've seen, those aren't necessarily, you know, savvy enough populations that they can go download, uh, uh, at least now, very esoteric Bitcoin software and, and run it on their own without any intermediaries. So, you know, mm -hmm. I think either you need to meet, meet them as far as their technological ability or, you know, just sort of wait for maybe it happens in a country that's, you know, maybe a little bit farther with, you know, complete cell phone and internet penetration and things like that. So. Yeah, well, the, those countries have been trading, especially in the African countries, because I used to work in Africa. Um, they, they've been trading cell phone minutes as currency for, for a couple of decades, or as long as cell phones have been, you know, since 2000. And it's, uh, so there is a, a, a little bit of a, uh, a, a more of a, a, I would say those countries would be possibly more conditioned to be able to use a digital currency like this. Um, the other thing that's, that's kind of interesting is the, uh, these global financial institutions out of Japan that are starting to create their own digital asset that's tied to the yen. And uh, these are multi-trillion dollar uh, financial institutions. And, uh, and, you know, there is such a, 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 to me, a bright future. And the, the usage of this, I know that it's still experimental in a lot of ways, but yeah, we'll just see how it unfolds. All right. And then, uh, yeah, I think the one other question I had on here, how, what do you feel about, uh, say, gold-backed cryptocurrencies or 
anything like that? Do you think gold will have any role in the the future of money? I it's the same thing as having a fiat currency system at that point because I you know here's here's the problem with that. I I've looked at, into these companies and I've kind of thought about that. And I know that there are several companies out there. I like the concept of it because I love gold, but I think they should be separate. I think that the only way to, to combine gold, silver, and crypto is to buy a cold storage coin and <laughs> load it on there and have your hybrid uh, with, you know, a thousand bucks worth of Bitcoin on a, on a copper, you know, cold storage coin or, uh, you know, 5,000 on a silver or whatever. Uh, I like the hybrid effect, but in terms of it being tied to holdings, uh, here's here's the problem once again, is that you have human beings that you have to trust, and this is what happens in every, you know, if you know Austrian economics and the history of uh, fiat currencies and money manipulation and bankers, this is the age-old issue with that, is that they start issuing notes on gold that they don't have right and uh, you know that's the problem with human beings and the trustless system of uh this digital um, currency system you don't need to tie it to a commodity because the ledger system is the com commodity to me and as long as it's not hackable there's no reason to uh to tie it to a to a physical commodity. And uh, I haven't heard an argument yet that I like, uh, because let's say that you have XYZ company and they have uh, X amount of gold in, in four different countries. Well, what happens when the, the military in that country decides that they want your gold? Right, you can't well, I do mean, anything, this... you know? Well, to be fair, you know, this was before Bitcoin, all the Austrian econ economists were arguing for gold still. You know, it was sort of, you just had that, the idea of competing currencies for a long time and that that would sort of solve the, in a free it's, market way. Yeah, but the the thing is that we never could figure out a, a, a way to do it without human error, without human greed, without human manipulation. So what and, what are the basics of Austrian economics for the uninitiated <laughs> i don't I, you know i'm not familiar uh well yeah so austrian economics is uh doesn't use any math there's that's the first basic <laughs> I, like, I, I like it already <laughs> <laughs> it's it's about human interaction uh it's about uh the free association and money being a a form of communication it's a it's a way for people to relate, communicate, and bring people to you know together, without uh, the coercion of a central banking system, and so it's the ability to use a unit of measure, and uh, without any sort of uh, control of of a government. Um, so I, like I think like that's we were talking about earlier, like the community currencies and bartering systems that sort of fits into that philosophy, the Austrian economic. Yeah, well, what it, what it does is it allows for, so the, uh, it allows for people to be able to um, associate with one another without any coercion. And that association usually is done through some form of barter system or some sort of a trade system. And, and really all money is, is a, is a way for people to barter on it with an agreed upon uh, unit of measure. Right. Yeah. Um, but it, it's an, you know, it's, it's, it's based on having honest money and honest money means that there is no one manipulating the value of that money. The market decides that you let the free market decide. And free, free, we do not have a free market system in the United States. We have not had a free market system in the United States since 1913. So people that want to argue that free markets don't work, well, they, we have to go 
you know, further back. And there are some really good arguments against the free market system and the really good arguments for the free market system. And it, I think it really depends on where people are in their mindset and their, their attitudes and their belief systems as to whether or not they like uh, the idea of a, an Austrian economic system. But the, the primary thing is that uh, people uh, have the ability or the freedom to decide for themselves how they're going to live their lives. And it's based to solely in freedom. And these Austrians came out of um, some horrific circumstances uh, when they brought, the, you know, this these philosophies uh, through the, you know, Nazi Germany. And, and there's, there's a lot of reasons for not having a central banking system. Central, you know, the fifth plank of the Communist Manifesto is a strong central bank. And so, you know, if you like communism, central banking is cool. And that's a good, good thing to have. It's a good way to, to keep it going. So. Yeah. No, I mean, we're always super excited that, you know, you can sort of use Bitcoin to have this competing piece to, you know, even, even if it does just keep central banks in check, the idea that you can sort of move over to something that works relatively quickly is, is awesome. So. To bring it back cool. to what we started on, uh, real, you know, what does, what does Ron Paul think about Bitcoin? Because I'm not... I don't think, <laughs> I don't think I know if he's ever mentioned that. And part B of that question is, are there any politicians that are speaking out in favor of this? And, you know, um, mm -hmm. is there anybody okay. that you're a big fan of going, you know, into, you know, the next campaign season? And that would be supportive um, of, of this community. Yeah. So Thomas Massey, Rand Paul, Rand Paul was the first uh, politician to accept Bitcoin as a donation. And uh, Thomas Massey is a big advocate. Uh, I think Justin Amash is as well. I, I don't think that, uh, I, oh, I, uh, when we were at Token Fest, um, Dennis Kucinich was there. Yeah. And I got a chance to spend some time with him. Uh, yeah, the, the, the folks that are, that understand what central banking does and the influence it has over government and corporations and war and, uh, you know, interference with people's individual liberty, uh, the war on drugs. Uh, there's, you know, all the different wars. Uh, there is a little bit of a, a coercion factor and a reason for that because it's gaming the system and it's benefiting uh, the individuals that own corporations uh the prison industrial complex I mean, there's no yeah there's no question that uh there's a relationship but if you follow the money and so uh so anyway th these politicians that understand freedom are interested in, in what the possibilities are with cryptocurrency um ron paul i, I couldn't answer if he's what he thinks about bitcoin but I do know that he has been a big advocate for competing currencies. So Bitcoin being uh, considered a currency, I, I'm, my guess would be that he would appreciate it, but I don't know that he knows a lot about it or what he knows about it. I actually haven't, haven't even seen much about what he thinks. So yeah, no, I mean, that was, it fits him. Like a glove, I'm sure. I'm, I'm, I wonder if he, if he just doesn't want to come out and make a, a statement about it yet. Or I think I think he's right. Ron Paul appreciates competing currencies is yeah. kind of his stance. You know, whichever one mm -hmm. free market wants to move to. It's not he's, that he's he's not not necessarily he's not trying to control experience. anything. That's for sure. He's, yeah. he's a, you know get out of the way. Sure. So, you know, I, I think we can sort of wrap it up um, as uh, any, anything else you want to plug. Uh, you can send people over to go buy a cold storage coin or we should just wait to see it in a store. That would be great. Uh, if you go to coldstoragecoins.com, you can check out the website and explore it. Um, there, you know, our company uses uh, uh, um, 
a, a system where we load our manufacturing process on the blockchain so that we're transparent about how we manufacture the coins. If people are concerned about us uh, manufacturing these coins and laser etching private keys on them, what do we do with the private keys? That's a that's an important question that yep. uh, that we're asked on, on a regular basis. And the answer to that is we destroy them. We use a Department of Defense protocol. I'm not going to tell you the the entire process because it's proprietary, but it's in an airtight room where we create these. And anyone that works on a on a run of coins is uh, is loaded on the blockchain on a on a PDF, and we use that They're technology. To Jekyll Island, it's never to be seen again. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and we, the the names the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Yes. We we manufacture yeah, them in Singapore, where you you get it's a five hundred dollar fine to chew gum, and so uh, <laughs> we don't want to get caned. They and mean so business. We, we go. Yeah, we 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 we're in Singapore strategically because we want people to understand that we're in this sort of long haul. We've been manufacturing for over a decade. We're that's what we do. We're manufacturers. We know how to manufacture, and we're in the business of selling coins. We want to sell a lot of them, and so we really think that people should load just a little bit on each coin and buy a lot of them, <laughs> and, uh, and that's it. But well, so, and you get your uh, gold exposure too. So there you go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, well, what's great for us is we are traditionally silver and gold bugs, and we believe in precious metals. And right. our company also has a sister company called Hotco.co, and we're the world leader in silver statue manufacturing. We, we've got hundreds of, of different incredible uh, silver statues that we've uh, pulled off of artwork that uh, we've been licensed to make, uh, like Frank Frazetta. And, uh, and a variety of other incredible artists. And, uh, and so we're in the business of manufacturing. We're manufacturers and, and we're big fans of, of silver and gold. And we don't think that that's gonna go away. The value of that's always gonna be there. It's a true commodity, but it gets manipulated too in the, in the paper markets. And that's a concern with the ETFs and Bitcoin and you know the, that big battle there, which is a whole nother conversation. Yeah, whenever we have yeah. three hours to discuss it, we'll we'll be sure to <laughs> next time <laughs> <laughs> hop into precious metal manipulation theories. And <laughs> there you go. Be good. Um, no, but thanks for being on. You know, it was uh, it was definitely a great conversation. Definitely much yeah, more, awesome. uh, much different than a lot of the other conversations we've had. So, <laughs> well, Michael Nicholas, thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, thanks. We'll be uh, we'll be in touch and we'll definitely send it to you. Okay, Take care. great. Take you care. too. See you. See you. Bye.